All right, ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. No matter where you're watching us from around the globe, I say thank you for allowing us into your home and into your lives. If you're watching us on Roku or you're watching us on Amazon Fire, a sincere thank you, and I appreciate you. If you're listening to us in podcast form, turn us up and let us put that flavor in your ear. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, it's time to lace them up with another edition of the Coach Scott Field Show. This is where we put sexy into the sports talk. Remember to send in your questions, comments, or even your emoji reactions during this conversation. And today, we're going to use the hashtag ME seven foot four. That's right. We're taking our show to new heights today, baby. Uh, awful excited to have my guest with us today. If you're sitting there and you're watching us and you're saying, why should I spend the next hour listening to this show? Let me explain how special this is. Our special guest today, two-time defensive player of the year, three-time all-NBA defensive team, He's an NBA All-Star, and what better way to kick off the NBA All-Star weekend than having one with us right here today? He played in 875 games for the Utah Jazz, making him the third most games played by any Utah Jazz member. That's right, his number 53 is hanging up in the rafters, and we'll get into that. One of his Utah Jazz teammates called him the ultimate team player. That was John Stockton. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, author, successful businessman, corporate speaker, all around great guy. He is a team expert. Ladies and gentlemen, this is my buddy, Mr. Mark Eaton. Mark, welcome to the show, and uh, I'm glad you're here with us today, buddy. Well, thanks, Scott. It's great to be with you here today, so I appreciate the invitation. Oh, hey, listen, it's beautiful. We got the sun shining and I'm sure up there where you're located, that snow is deep and you could probably be out there on your horse or, you know, watching some elk if you if if you had time. Right. Yeah, that got a little skiing in this week as well. Oh, good for you. Good for you. Again, ladies and gentlemen, this is Mark Eaton. Please use the hashtag as you bring in these comments today. Hashtag M.E. Seven foot four. As we mentioned, I, I'm excited. I've got a copy of his book right here, ladies and gentlemen, and Mark will get into this later on where you can find this outstanding book. I highly recommend it. Uh, the Four Commitments of a Winning Team. And what what better discussion to have with a team expert like Mark? Uh, you know, our state, our teams, our businesses, our country could use teamwork right now because teamwork makes the dream work. So, Mark, let's dive into that, my friend. Uh, what was the motivation behind the book? Well, the motivation behind the book is that uh, for the last uh, 12 years or so, I've been doing corporate motivational speaking and um, people would always ask me, you know, boy, I'd like a little more beyond the speech. Like, what do I need to do next? And uh, it took me a while to put it together. You know, as you know, putting a book together is kind of challenging. And, uh, but um, after many stops and starts, uh, my buddy Richard Paul Evans really helped me get it over the finish line. And and uh, so, and then my wife edited it and we got it done. And so the motivation was really to provide something to the people I speak for as an additional tool, something to take home, something to dig deeper in, and also an opportunity for me as a speaker to go beyond the keynote. And here's, here's some other things that you can think about. And so that was really the, the impetus behind the book and to be a business tool that people could use uh, to help their team individually and share some of the lessons I learned along with some of the business people I've met uh, and coaches that I've had who shared uh, their wisdom with me. Well, you know, Mark, I, I'm grateful to have it. And uh, it came to me here this week and I've already delved into it and I'm really enjoying some of the takeaways that I've taken. Where can people find this book? Um, it's available on Amazon, uh, Kindle, uh, Audible, all those platforms uh, and probably a few others that, like you mentioned, uh, some of the other platforms you're on. I know it's on some other platforms. I've listed it, but I always can't keep track of where they are. Or <laughs> and once again, ladies and gentlemen, this is our guest, Mark Eaton. It's the four commitments of a winning team by Mr. Mark Eaton. Make sure we go out and uh, support him, support this book. And again, take these tools for your toolbox, no matter what walk of life that you're in, because it's very, very empowering and super excited to have Mark on with us here today. Mark, you've had a phenomenal career in basketball. We're basketball guys. We have many friends 
and many common acquaintances here in the Salt Lake Valley. Um, what did it mean to you? I mean, because it's well documented that you go from auto mechanic to an NBA All Star. What would what did it mean to you to don the U, UCLA Bruins jersey? Well, uh, that's an interesting story. Um, I played well at junior college, as you mentioned. I was an auto mechanic at age 21. Decided to go back to junior college for two years uh, with a coach that taught me how to be a big guy and um, had two successful years there and went to UCLA. Uh, I'd grown up in Southern California. I thought, well, this is the place I wanna be, right? And um, Larry Brown recruited me. Uh, and I kind of thought growing up in Southern California, like I can't not go there, right? Like I've got to give this a shot. And uh, so it was exciting at first uh, to be there, but then as the season went on, I wasn't playing very much. It wasn't so exciting. <laughs> it was a little frustrating. But I had a great time there for two years as a student and the culture of the school and all that stuff was there. Uh, that was uh, uh, very important. And obviously the basketball heritage of the place, even though I didn't play very much at UCLA, you know, still being part of that crew of, of UCLA basketball players who went to the NBA is a, a pretty impressive list. Oh, it is. And, and you, th you think about that tradition and culture that you talked about. I'm an Indiana guy originally, so when you say John Wooden and the success that he had as a coach and that to have one of the best basketball minds to be able to work with you, you know, as you're developing as a person, as a player at, at your tender age, I, I think, wow, what a tremendous opportunity. It's also well documented that you had a conversation with Mr. Wilt Chamberlain. What did that conversation with Wilt Chamberlain do for you as a person but, but yet, better yet, what did that do for you on your career path as a seven foot four big man? Because as Frank Layden always says, Coach Layden's a great guy. You don't teach height. <laughs> right, right. Uh, well, it was it was a, a real um, light bulb experience for me. Uh, you know, I had had a couple of good years at junior college. I had the basics of how to play basketball. When I got to UCLA, of course, the game was much faster, much quicker. Larry Brown ran an up-tempo style game, which really didn't fit well when you're 7'4 and 280 pounds, right? And uh, so um, uh, that summer between my junior and senior year, I was really frustrated. And, uh, and, I, and every afternoon, there'd be these great pickup games at the uh, men's gym at UCLA. And the men's gym was up above Poly Pavilion. And it was, uh, there are two buildings, a men's gym and a women's gym that built like 1925. And we'd go upstairs to these kind of hot, sweaty places, and everybody who was a great player in LA would show up. I mean, you know, like Magic was there, Norm Nixon, and uh, you know, there's some other great old Laker players like Jimmy Price and guys like that. You probably have to look up, but uh, <laughs> but the games were really like NBA All Star games because there were so many players from Los Angeles that uh, you know, great that would come there every afternoon and, and hoop. And so I'm playing in these games every afternoon, and I'm like. 10 steps behind everybody. I mean, I can't get this figured out. Like the game is so fast and so quick. And like, where, what do I do out here? And, and one day I was just kind of standing on the sidelines for a minute and I was looking a little dejected and kind of holding my shorts and thinking, you know, I just don't know if I can play at this level. And at that moment, I feel this big, large hand on my shoulder and I turn around and it's Will Chamberlain. And, wow. um, and he said, you know, uh, he, get, he said, first of all, young fellow, he goes, you're never going to catch those faster guys out there. So like, stop doing that. And I'm like, okay. And he goes, it's really not your job. And I'm like, what? He goes, come here. And so he took me out of the court and he put me right in front of the basket. And he said, you see this basket back here? He goes, your job is to stop players from getting there. And your job is to make them miss their shot and collect the rebound and throw it up to the guard and let them go down the other end and score it. And your job is to kind of cruise up to half court and see what's going on. And I was like, wait a minute, wow. just, play, just play defense? And he said, yes. He goes, that's something you can be really good at. And uh, it, it, was, it was like instantly I knew where I fit out on the court. And so he took all the craziness of basketball, of trying to go faster and run faster and shoot more and shoot further out. He's like, no. He's like, just park your rear end right here. He said, that's something you can be great at. And so in that moment, I figured out what I needed to do and what I needed to let go of, right? And, and he showed me how I could be a benefit to my team by doing that. And that little five minute conversation completely turned my head around. And I turned that into a 12 year MBA career because I just started focusing on that one thing that I could be great at. And I challenge people in my presentations, you're like, what's that one thing you need to focus on that you're already good at? Because we always think about our weaknesses, right? I need to improve this, I need to fix that. 
And my standpoint after going through that experience was like, no, like find the one thing you're good at and do more of it and go deeper with it. And so I became a defensive specialist. And, uh, you know, I came to the Utah Jazz after that. And, and um, you know, within a few months, Frank Layden saw the same thing and turned me into this, you know, let's focus on everything that's going on right now, uh, de or focus defensively about on our, as far as getting our fast break started, let's get a steal, let's get a block shot, let's create a create a deflection and create energy to create a fast break at the other end of the floor, that's going to give us uh, an opportunity to score more easily than trying to walk the ball up and, and uh, you know, set up the offense. So, so anyway, it was, it was an incredible experience that, uh, that changed me forever. And I'm forever grateful to Wilt for doing that because he'd already retired from the NBA and he lived up above campus up in Bel Air there. And he'd come down and hoop with us. Then he'd go down to the beach and play volleyball. He was, he was the most incredible athlete I have uh, ever seen. Uh, amen. Yeah, and that's that's like in his late forties at that point in time, and he's still dunking on us and running the floor, and we're like, "Wow, there's, there's right. anything this guy can't do." Well, and and you think about one of the best big men to ever do it, and you think of the rivalries between he and Bill Russell, and the fact that he took time to see you and what your strengths were, and to put you in a situation to be successful. It had to be an epiphany for you because you're like, "Okay, yeah." let me focus on this one thing and perfect that one thing and yet make it an asset to the franchise that, you know, you're going to be drafted to. It, it had to be an epiphany for you. Yeah, it, it, it was. And it stuck with me ever since. And I'm, uh, you know, he would, he would come out and help young guys and he'd wander around to some of the summer leagues in LA back there. We played down at uh, Loyola Marymount. We played at Cal state LA. We played at LA trade tech in the city. Uh, and he'd show up a lot of times to these games. He just loved being around the game. And, uh, and he was always very kind to all the players and just say, hey, you know, have you ever thought about this? Have you ever thought about that? And he got a chance to see me play a couple of times in the NBA. Uh, he was here. Uh, he came to Park City for some kind of an event during one winter. And he came and watched me play. And I was like, always so appreciative that that a guy like that would pay any attention to me, right? I mean, I'm just uh, kind of get it figured out. And here's this guy who's like the greatest of all time. And uh Wow. But I, I, you know, I think about that frequently along with the other people that help me and, and I try and help other guys the same way and, and business people, because that's just what it's about. You know, it's like passing the wisdom on. That's right. Uh, steel sharpened steel for sure. But let's get into some more of that background. Who made you fall in love with the game of basketball? Where did that, where did that love come from? Because again, you mentioned being kind of dejected, trying to figure it out, you know, where do I fit in and some insecurities and low self-esteem, but. Well, there's a, there's a couple levels of that. Uh, um, primarily uh, early in my life, you know, in high school, I wasn't very good. Um, I didn't know what to do on the basketball court. I never played. I had no success with it whatsoever. And after high school, I just said, you know, that's it. Let's go and do something else. And so I actually went to trade school to learn to be an auto mechanic because I right. grew up. A, my father was a marine diesel mechanic, and I grew up okay. around the wrenches and engines, and that's really all I knew in terms of a skill. And uh, so I thought, well, if, you know, if I get go to trade school for a year, at least I can do something and make some money. And uh, and I was working in an auto shop uh, for about a year and a half, kind of a tire center, you know, like a big O tires, a similar thing. It was called Mark C. Bloom. It was in Buena Park, California, and. Um, and one day a junior college coach came around the corner from Cypress College was right down the street about three miles. And this junior college coach came around the corner one day and saw me standing out on the corner of this busy intersection talking to a customer. He's like, whoa, you know, who is that guy? And came in and like everyone else started to tell me about basketball. Well, you know, when you're seven feet, well, I was seven foot four <laughs> by that time. Uh, you know, and, and so everybody that came in had a comment to make or something to say. And I was just like, you know, people just, if you want your car fixed, let me know. I'm happy to help you. And um, I'm here to work on cars, not talk about basketball. And, but this gentleman turned out to be a coach who had some unique experience. His name was Tom Lubin. And his uncle had been a guy by the name of Frank Lubin, who played on the first Olympic basketball team in like the 1930s. He was wow. like six, nine. And he had learned some basic skills, I don't know where, at low post, some moves that you could make, like three or four moves on either side of the key with no dribbling. So we're talking like, you know, catch the ball, take a step across the key, hook shot, catch the ball, turn, bank shot, um, you, know, re in, you know, reverse pivot, whatever it was, drop step, crab dribble, go up strong. And um, 
And, and so he took me out of the court one day after there's a whole long story about how many times it took him to even get for me to even go out on the court with him for 30 minutes. But um, eventually I did that. And, um, and, and I was intrigued enough. And, and the other part about it was he said, look, if you want to try this basketball thing, he said, I will be here for you every day. I will show you what you need to do. And so we would we would meet before before I went to work at six in the morning and start running. And then after work, I'd go to the gym for a couple of hours and we'd work on these moves and work on footwork. We'd go to the weight room a little bit. And I just decided I'd try it for a few months just to see what it'd be like, you know. And I played in a few summer league games for the junior college and then decided to go back to school that, um, that fall and um, start this basketball career. And I, just, I thought, well, I'll just do it for a year and see what happens. In the meantime, I get some education and maybe that'll help me with my auto mechanic career. <laughs> and uh, uh, and so after that, but that first year went really well, and uh, I ended up being drafted by the Phoenix Suns after my freshman year, because back then there was a rule that if your class had graduated, whether or not you'd been in school yourself, you were eligible for the draft. And so much like Larry Bird, uh, the Phoenix Suns said, well, we'll take a chance on him, like the fifth round pick. I mean, it wasn't a lot of big deal, but, but um, I, you know, obviously I wasn't going to sign with them because it was like a make good contract for like 30 grand. And, and, you know, you had to be on the team through the end of December to make sure to even assure that you were going to be paid that money. And I decided to stay in school, obviously, but at the same time, it really woke me up and said, wow, you know, maybe there's something here. And so I had to really kind of double down at that point in time and said, okay, I better get serious about this. So I quit my job as a mechanic. I got a job selling cars. I worked as a bouncer and um, got through the second year there at that junior college and we won the state championship in California which was which was a big deal because there's a lot yeah. of fees in California right and, right it's uh, like you got your one state has like what is the national tournament for everybody else in junior college right right and yeah. great players and great competition and um, so so that's kind of how I started and then and then uh, later on when you're talking about the competence uh, aspect um, you know the Things didn't go that well at UCLA, and at the end of my senior year, in fact, I think I played less minutes my senior year than I did my junior year. I played for another coach named Larry Farmer. That's right. And I was again really frustrated at that point in time. And and my coach Tom, who just you know continued to egg me on to like just keep working, keep working. It's not about this year. It's about where we're going long term, right? And so I I did that. You know, he'd say stuff like, "If you're not going to play in the games, make you know make the practices your games. Be the first guy there, the last to leave. Continue to do your running, your shooting, hit the weight room, etc." Because I'm telling you, you will have an opportunity to try out at the next level if you get yourself ready now. And and so um, I would I continued to do that. And after my senior year, we're like, "Okay, what do we do? How do we market ourselves to the NBA?" Because back then, the only way you got drafted is if there was these scouting services that would go around the country and watch players. They'd write reports and they would send them to NBA GMs, right? Because there's no internet or any of that kind of stuff. Right, right. So, you know, nobody knew who I was because I was just like sitting on the end of the bench at UCLA. It's like, who's that guy? I don't know. And so um, we created our own marketing campaign and I paid my own way to go to a couple of tryout camps in Cincinnati and one in Jersey City where there maybe might be a scout or two. And we started then calling NBA teams on the telephone. So the, we started with the worst teams because like, who's going to give an unknown guy a chance, right? A team that really needs help. And uh, we called the Utah Jazz on the telephone and, um, and Frank Layden answered the phone back there because only about five people in the front office back then in 82. And he's like, Mark Eaton, never heard of him. You know, send me a tape. And we did. And he claimed years later, all he received was 30 minutes of me taking on off my warmups at UCLA. But he, <laughs> but he, but he, um, he finally, but he took a chance on me. He drafted me in the fourth round. And then he came out and watched me play in a summer league at Loyola Marymount, where I was playing actually for, for Larry Bird's team that uh, had, uh, or excuse me, Larry Brown's team that the New Jersey Nets. And so Larry Brown, who didn't play me in college, at least let me play in a summer league team. And Frank came out and watched me play. And he's like, you know, he goes, I, I can tell you're kind of rough, but I like the height. I like what you can do. And I'd be willing to guarantee your first year of, uh, of the NBA, which at that time I think was $40,000 or $45,000. And you come out, you know, you come to Utah and we'll stick with you for a year. And so that took a lot of pressure off of me because I was still looking at, do I go to Europe? I had an offer in Israel. I had another one in Spain, but I think the top one was like 25 grand. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so I came to Salt Lake in 82 
And then Frank continued to work with me and said, you know, work with our coaches, come early, a month early to camp, do our weight training program, work with our coaches, get on our running program. And, um, you know, and then, and then a few months later, I became the starting center. The pivotal moment in that, in terms of confidence, was about the, a month into the season. We're playing down in Dallas they're in, uh, against the Mavericks. They're an expansion team that year. And uh, Frank puts me in the game in the beginning of the second quarter. And I block like six shots in like five minutes. And I remember after one of the block shots, turning around and starting to glance, uh, you know, run up the court. And I glanced over at the coaches and they're all looking at each other like, and I'm like, okay, <laughs> okay, I can hang in this game. And, uh, and again, it was just doing one thing. It's like play defense, block shots, my Wilt Chamberlain stuff. And, and that carried me for 12 years. Wow. See, I, I think that's just a phenomenal story. And, and you think of the hustle that you put into it with yourself and then Coach Lubin. And I think it's phenomenal that you had that support system to continue to push you because they saw something great in you and knowing what you could do. And then you, now you think, wow, a 12 year NBA career, you know, being here in beautiful Salt Lake City with, with Coach Layden, you know, Frank and Barb are just phenomenal people. I think the world of both of them. Um, you know, I, I also think back to before you got to Utah, you know, I think UCLA lost to BYU and Danny Ainge that year, correct? Yeah, yeah. Danny, Danny Ainge owes me <laughs> because we made him an All-American. We held him to 37 points. <laughs> yeah, so what, what did you see or what did you learn about Danny Ainge getting beat by BYU while you were at UCLA before you came to Utah? Well, I, well, so we lost to BYU in the first round of the NCAA tournament my senior year. And, yeah. uh, or no, maybe that's my, that was my junior year, actually. Larry Brown was the coach. And, um, and then, and the next in that bracket was Notre Dame. And, you know, UCLA had this big rivalry with Notre Dame, but we'd beaten them twice that year. We beat them at home and we beat them in South Bend. So we were feeling pretty good about that. And we're like, BYU, who is that? You know, a lot of the guys on the team were just kind of thinking past, right? You know, they didn't even know who they were. And like, oh, we'll beat these guys and we'll go on and take on Notre Dame. And uh, Danny Ainge had something else to say about that. And of course, then two of the guys became my teammates, uh, Fred Roberts. And then yeah. uh, who was the other guy that tried out for our team back then? He didn't make the team, but um, Steve uh, Trumbo. I was another guy who went, went on to have a great career in Spain and Italy. But um, so Fred, Fred Roberts and I are still really good friends because he was my teammate for a long time. We talk about that game once in a while, but I, didn't I, get to, I don't think I even played that night. But uh, we went to Providence, Rhode Island, all confident that we were going to just take care of them and got our butts kicked. <laughs> <laughs> Ready to, you kind of you were looking past them. You're like, OK, Notre Dame's coming up. Digger Phelps, this is going to be great. And here, yeah. here comes the rah rah. Uh, again, a great story. You know, you talked about, you know, the influence that Coach Layden had with you, you know, with your time coming here. You know, he guaranteed you the, the contract for that first year. But who was your first NBA or professional mentor once you got here to Salt Lake City? Was there a player on the team that kind of said, hey, come on, big fella. This is how you this is how you're a pro. This is how you take care of your body. You know, those kind of things. Uh, yeah, well, a couple of them. Um, well, as a player, uh, Adrian Dantley, who, oh, who was, was kind of a, you know, challenge to play with some days because he was very methodical about his game, but he could give you 30 every night and uh, was carrying the team at that point in time. And he always took such great care of his body, came into camp in tremendous shape. And so that was kind of the first, the first guy who was a mentor as a, as a player. And I actually got along with him pretty well. A lot of players did, and he obviously had an issue with the coaches and stuff like that. But I loved running the little pick and roll with him because he was so good with his little rocker step, and he could just suck defenders up next to him. And then he'd throw me a little lob over the top, which I loved. Um, and, uh, and then Phil Johnson, probably, who was the assistant coach at that point in time, who'd previously been the head coach at Kansas City, and then what became the head coach again of the Sacramento Kings later, uh, he helped me tremendously because he had this wow. large, you know, this big background. He coached with Dick Mata, the Chicago Bulls, and he was a real strategist. And he really helped me understand the NBA game. We spent a lot of time together uh, talking about basketball over the years. And uh, so those are the two guys that probably helped me the most. And obviously Frank, because he just like right. gave me the opportunity and, and continued to play me. It's like, he just threw me out there and said, look, he'll figure it out. Like just, you know, and I made some real boneheaded plays the first few months as a player. Um, but he just let me kind of work through that and, you know, and we grew together. 
Yeah, see, and, and I love hearing that story because my time around Coach Phil Johnson, I mean, no, it's the epitome of loyalty. I mean, 23 years there with Coach Sloan, may he rest in peace, who was just a phenomenal person and leader himself. But yet, you know, Phil Johnson was a great teacher and an awesome communicator. I saw him working with guys out on the floor. And when Coach Sloan was so you know, gracious to me to allow me a couple of years between my head coaching jobs in China to, to come out and observe and, and be around a Hall of Fame guy. But Phil Johnson was just a class act and um, just just wonderful out on the floor. So I, I could definitely see where that was coming from. Um, talk. I mean, so you're coming to Salt Lake. Tell us some old stories about playing in the old Salt Palace. <laughs> I mean, there's got to be some uh, beauties. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it was an interesting walking time. around trying to invite people to come into a game. <laughs> yeah, it was an interesting time uh, because the Jazz were on the always on the verge of bankruptcy, right? I mean, back then the office staff was told not to cash their paychecks until the players cashed theirs. That's how bad it was, uh, right? Yeah. And they traded out everything, you know, advertising, signage, all kinds of stuff. It's like, yeah, we need we need some signage, but you want some tickets and. Uh, I think you could go to 7-Eleven back then and buy three tickets and get two three or two tickets and get three more free. I think um, I remember my first year, our seats for the players were like seven dollars a ticket. And and that was like in the third row. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, you know, we would do anything to get players to come to the or to get uh, fans to come to the game. Um, right? And so Frank would create all these things like we had. Uh, we had Magic Johnson poster night. We had Larry Bird poster night. I mean, like they didn't come to see us. It was like, who are they playing? <laughs> oh yeah, I like that guy. I want to go see Larry Bird play. Yeah, let's go watch him. Or you know, we Kareem had a birthday one day with when we were playing him, and so they brought out a big birthday king. Frank Layden would would joke later. He's like, yeah, I was hoping he'd eat it before he played. And uh, <laughs> so uh, um, he was just coming up with all these crazy um, promotions and. Um, uh, because it's just how it was back then. And Frank saw him as sort of the, himself as sort of the face of the team because nobody really knew who the players were that much. And so he would take every opportunity to go out and speak at a luncheon or go do a TV interview or anything he'd do to talk about the team. And so he kind of became the face of the team. And obviously he was very funny. He was a comedian, best luncheon speaker ever. Oh, and, still uh, to this day, still to this day. Yeah, so so it was kind of interesting back there, and they do kind of fun stuff like they had this. Uh, in fact, somebody just did a little retrospective about this the other day of the the old jazz band that played. I think it was sponsored by like Continental Bank or something like that. And uh, those guys had music going, and they had the popcorn vendors and the hot dog vendors and <laughs> people walking up and down the aisle and the beer vendors and everything else. And and so uh, it was just a, a fun experience to be a part of that. It was a little, you know wild because you didn't know where the team was going to go and they're talking about selling the team all the time this that and the other thing but but the experience of playing in that big old brick arena which was actually built for rodeos right um, was really fun the lighting sucked um you could <laughs> see the pillars right just, next to the court <laughs> yeah there was there was asbestos <laughs> falling down off the ceiling all the time from 80 <laughs> feet up there and um so uh but but at the same time the you know the the, the fans that were big fans back then became friends like we used to have a season ticket holder party in the lobby of the Hilton Hotel downtown, and there was like 200 people would show up, and uh, so you got to know a lot of the fans really well, and some of them are still my friends today from you know 35 years ago, uh, and uh, so it was just a, it was a real family fun experience, and they worked hard to make sure the players felt comfortable and felt included, and they would they actually would match you up with a family from the booster club who'd invite you over to dinner if you wanted to go on a Sunday or something, and. You know, it was, Salt Lake was a different place in 1982. But, you know what? Yeah. But I love that because there was such a sense of community and a sense of family with those old teams mm -hmm. like that, even though it was challenging. But yet I remember seeing, Mark, I got to share this story. I remember seeing uh, an old commercial that Coach Layton and Big T Thurl Bailey was doing. It was an old Indiana Jones thing. And then, of course, yeah, you know, the big ball was coming. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> and then, of course, you know, Frank, you know, gets rolled over by the ball and Scotty goes and picks up the hat, puts it on. Don't worry, Dad, I'll take it from here. But just fun, creative stuff like that. That was, you know, in those early 80s to do anything they could to promote the team. Well, yeah. And, and, you know, when David Stern came on board, he kind of changed all that and took it all as an NBA brand. But another one I remember was uh, 
a season ticket holder promotion video that Frank Layden did. And Frank, of course, for the people who don't know, was a pretty heavy set guy yeah. back then. And uh, so he goes out on the Great Salt Lake on the flats out there, and he's got his can gold hat on, a big old cigar, and one of those t-shirts that looks like you've got a ripped body, you know? Yeah. And he's jogging <laughs> to the theme from Chariots of Fire. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I would great. I would pay somebody a lot of money to find that video and and so so I could see that again because uh, oh. that was just it was just classic but that's how they you know they again they were, they were just like running by the seat of their pants like what else will you do to get more people in the building <laughs> yeah I I also remember another time he was telling a story we, we were sitting there at lunch and I was like coach I said how about that one time that Morgana the kissing bandit came out and kissed <laughs> you and he goes he goes best moment of my life. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, oh. um, he was a piece of work and they remember oh. the time when we were playing the lakers of course remember pat riley used to always comb his hair you know during the game he had that comb he'd pull out and we're playing the lakers one day and frank's got his his big old plaid sport coat on and he pulls out one of those big giant like clown combs it's like about this big <laughs> he starts doing this with his hair and everybody in the arena just lost it and frank and uh, pat riley just he couldn't stop laughing it was that's just um. how it was yeah, that's as I was saying. I just there, there's so many great Coach Frank stories that are out there, and it's so fun to to kind of spend a whole other show just telling those. Yeah. Oh, exactly. Yeah, and then of course those old you know NBA bloopers that he used to do with Marv Albert. I mean, he just didn't take it so seriously. I mean, he had fun with it. I mean, he knew his role, and he you know he knew what he brought to the to the franchise. But to me, he was he was a genius. He was just first class. <laughs> um, how about how about Coach Jerry Sloan? What what life lessons do you still carry with you today that were instilled to you by Hall of Fame coach Jerry Sloan? Well, I you know uh, Jerry was one of my my best friends and and uh, it, was, it was hard to let him go this summer. Um, oh. But um, I think what I learned from him when he came because he came into the team as an assistant first because when Phil Johnson left and took the job with. Uh, uh, I, maybe they're still in, you know, they're in Sacramento. There's the Kings were just moving to Sacramento from Kansas city. Um, I really felt kind of bad because I loved Phil and I was really kind of, in fact, I was kind of ticked off at him for a while. He was leaving, but I get it. It was like, you know, it was a, it was a long-term guaranteed deal to go to go coach over there. And, and so they brought Jerry Sloan in because Jerry and Phil had worked together when Phil was an assistant with the bulls, when Jerry played for Dick Mata there. And so Jerry brought this real intensity to the game. And so he kind of took as an assistant, first of all, he really focused on defense and, uh, you know, and man to man defense. Like he didn't want anything to do with zone. With Phil Johnson, we played some shifting defenses from time, some matchup defenses. And Jerry was like, one on one, that's it. And so um, he challenged guys and he'd get into it with players like Bobby Hansen or whatever. Uh, uh, about how to get through the high pick and rolls and you know you really need to shoot your hand through and and he didn't take any crap from anybody um, and so when he became the head coach uh, he really took the framework that Frank had and said okay we're going to turn up the heat a little bit like you guys are pretty good but now we're going to challenge you for a little bit more and what I loved about him was he was very consistent he demanded the same things day after day and I use him a lot of my leadership principles when I talk with businesses because Frank, Frank was an emotional leader and he could be kind of up and down different things. And Jerry was just like, no, nope, this is what I expect every day. And he'd get mad if he couldn't do it because he wasn't asking to do anything that didn't require anything more than effort. He knew that some days the shots weren't going to go. We'd get crappy calls, whatever it was that happened. But the one thing, the things you could control, playing defense, getting rebounds, uh, you know, getting deflections, all those types of things. He, uh, he just demanded that effort. And if you weren't willing to show him that, then we had a problem. And he would challenge guys in the locker room. He'd challenge guys in the timeouts. Uh, and he was a fighter, you know, first and foremost. Like, if you want a guy in the foxhole with you, that's who he wants, Jerry Sloan. Hey, Amen. Right? that's right. That's um, and right. So, so I really appreciated that from a player because you knew what was going to happen every day when you came to work. And, um, and he was just the greatest. And obviously, you know, 23 years, the longest tenured coach in, in pro sports at that time when he retired, uh, was just, just incredible. And, and coaching through the ups and downs and the great years of John and Carl, everything else, just, you can't say enough about him. And, and the same thing, and the best part was that even up till a couple of years ago, I could, I could call him and I could say, hey, Jerry, I'm building a fence in my backyard. Can you come help me dig some pole soles? He'd go, oh yeah, I'll get in my truck. I'll be right over that's just the kind of guy he was. And that's, that's, right. what, that's what I loved about him, down home. 
That's right. You know, there, there was no fluff. He was very direct. He was very honest. He was going to hold you accountable. And I think uh, there was something very refreshing about that because, you know, as the old adage goes, he's not going to let the tail wag the dog. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, I, you know, he, you know, I, oh boy, he had some great sayings, boy. He'd quit jackpotting around. And, and yo, yo, you, guys the old playing, you, guys look, you guys look like mashed potatoes out there. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, he was just the best. And uh, I, I really hope that this new ownership comes in and I really hope that they can erect a statue for him outside of Vivid Smart Home Arena, you know, there with with, you know, your teammates, uh, Carl yeah, and we John. We need a Jerry Sloan night, that's for sure. 100 percent. Let's uh, let's start rallying to get that done. I, I'm, I'm with you 100 um, percent. You know, we talked about, you know, you being the ultimate team player. You know, John Stockton called you that. And you, you think of John Stockton as. And, and his longevity and his career as well. What did you learn from, from a John Stockton off the court? John was always just about winning. Uh, he really didn't care about anything else. Um, you know, he cared about his teammates, uh, but obviously, um, and he was a great family guy. And all he really cared about was going to, coming to the gym, lacing it up and giving it his best every single day. And so similar to Jerry Sloan in that regard, uh, very consistent. Uh, and uh, one of my favorite teammates, we'd hang out together a lot on the road and go to dinner and things like that. And, and so he's probably one of my best friends. Um, yeah, but um, uh, what I loved about him was his intensity. And, uh, you know, the NBA is all about maintaining uh, energy and maintaining focus over a long, grueling season. And anyone can have a great game on a Monday and then go to sleep for two weeks, right? Uh, the key to winning in the NBA is that consistent effort night after night after night. And John brought that and Carl uh, um, was a lot like that as well. Uh, and so you just come in the locker room, you could be limping or gimping a little bit. And he just give you the eye like uh, you will be out there tonight. Yes, yes, John, I will. Uh, and so we didn't, we didn't miss games. We, we played hurt a lot of times uh, because we wanted to win. And um, I think uh, his, his career, if you go back and look at how many games John Stockton missed during his 19 year career, it's just, uh, it's, you know, now we talk it's about, dollar. now we talk about load management and all these things. <laughs> with, if you want to get Carl or John really ticked off, start talking to him about that. Uh, That's right. The, because we just, we just grew together as a team and John was the leader and he would challenge guys. He'd get in their face at times. Uh, but he was always from a place of, it was always from a place of winning and wanting to win and wanting to get better every single day. And I love that because it inspired me to work harder. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, we're talking with Mark Eaton here today on the Coach Scott Field Show. Again, author of The Four Commitments of a Winning Team. Uh, it's just a pleasure to have Mark, you know, sharing these stories here with us. Again, let's use that hashtag ME7 foot four. Um, it's great to hear these stories from the old jazz days and you know, hearing it from the insights of a guy who was in the trenches, uh, you know, building this franchise to make it what it is today, to give it the value that it has. Uh, you know, we've talked about John Stockton and I mean, I think about, you know, how, how tough he was and how he was. He was the he was the perfect mirror image of Coach Sloan on the floor because he was tough and he was hard nosed and, you know, he was unselfish. But I think of him, you know, coming off that UCLA cut and coming up, setting those up screens on that big and, you know, him getting getting into those ribs a little bit. But uh, just just a great competitor. And, you know, then I also think, too, that, you know, yeah, you played with some great guys, uh, you know, that was in this franchise. But then you also think to MVP Carl Malone. What did you take from Carl Malone in all those years of, you know, going out there, lacing them up together and going to battle to, you know, get your guys' you know, playoff runs going? Well, I'm going to go back to Adrian Dantley for a minute because uh, the, the work ethic that AD had when Carl came on board, he was a young guy just out of college, um, you know, you know, good shape, but not great shape. I mean, you don't really know what kind of condition you need to be in until you get out on the court and play a few games. And um and AD kind of took him under his wing and said, hey, man, young fellow, you know, if you want to play 12 years in this league, you got to take better care of your body and showed him some things. And Carl just took it by storm and he started, you know, hitting the weight room and hitting the spin classes and everything else that he needed to do to get in the best condition. That coupled with as he went on in his career uh, and became this incredible low post force. Um, the referees couldn't call all the fouls. It was just impossible. You get fouled at low post almost every time you shoot down there, especially back in the 80s and 90s, right? And 
uh, Carl figured that out that, you know, the refs were never going to call all the fouls and he just learned how to get stronger and how to go through guys. And he would just put his forearm right across your face and go to the basket. And I was always glad he was on my team in practice. Let me tell you. <laughs> um, but, uh, uh, and so that commitment to working that hard, to improving his body, to learning his game, to learn how to improve his shooting skills and his mm -hmm. scoring skills and rebounding and everything else. I was always amazed because other, I mean, we played against tough guys like Buck yeah. Williams and guys like that just beat the crap out of him at low post. And, um, and he just took it and he just got stronger and faster and went to the ball, went to the basket harder and, you know, and hurt a few guys along the way who yeah. got, got in the way. Uh, but, uh, but that's what I, you know, he's a great teammate from that standpoint because he always played same thing. I'll be out there coach. And a lot of the games he missed were simply ones he got a technical or said something, but again, go back and look at his, how many games he missed during, during the injury in his career. So, you know, very, very few uh, over an 18 year career. So um, an incredible all-star, all, you know, hall of famer like John that just, um, you know, I was really blessed to play with. Yeah. And, you know, and here, you know, we're talking about the greatness of all these guys. And yet then I sit there and I think, you know, Mark Eaton, you, I mean, you were the centerpiece and the anchor of the defense, that that rim protector who would run from rim to rim, body. Like you say, the game was so physical back then. I mean, you know, it's so well documented how many career block shots that you had against every team. And most of the teams, you know, you had more than 10 blocks in a, in a game against those guys. And I just think what a phenomenal, you know, piece of, of that team. But when you look back at it now, you know, now that the heat of battle is gone because the competitive juices flow, who was the toughest matchup for you on any given night? I mean, I know you've played against Kareem and a, and a young Hakeem Olajuwon and, you know, just some phenomenal big men. But who was the one that, you, you know, you marked on your calendar like, hey, this guy's coming up. I'm ready for this game, and this is going to be a battle. Who who was that guy? That well, you know, I, I there was a number of them, I think. I think when I first started – um, I remember I, I played against Bob Lanier his last year and, yeah. uh, and he was, you know, he was kind of beat up at that point in time, but he knew all these little tricks. Like anytime I put my arm around him to guard, and guard him and he's clamping down on my other arm and he's walking me around the court and I can't go anywhere. Uh, and, uh, you know, the things I learned from that, then Artis Gilmore is another one who came to mind, who was, uh, played for the Bulls and the Spurs. And, uh, and again, he was this other big, imposing physical force that was difficult to deal with as a young player. And, and the objective back then was to really meet these guys at the free throw line and bump them all the way down to low post. Because That's when you could bump to, the cutter. <laughs> yeah, you want to yeah, try and get them a foot or yeah, two go further back. out from their sweet spot where they like to shoot from. Right. right. Don't let them get comfortable. And uh, so there's a lot of banging that went on. And, and I learned very quickly that I needed to be in much better shape myself. And I started doubling down on the weight room and everything like that. Because I'm like, you're going to be the pusher or the push E. And I decided I'd rather be the pusher. And so um, so there are those two guys. Kareem, obviously, a great threat. Uh, and um, and then when Akeem Olajuwon came into the league in 84, 85, um, he changed the whole game because he had this soccer background. Yeah, that so this guy playing playing the center spot that's got such quick feet, and you think you'd have him pinned, posting up, you know, and all of a sudden he, he's around you, stole the ball, and, and is dribbling it down the court, right? And five men just didn't do that back then. Uh, and so that changed everything. In fact, I think he led the NBA in steals and block shots one year as a center. Wow. Uh, and uh, and we laugh about it now, but we we really ran at each other because they you know the Rockets were in our division, in the Midwest Division, so we played them like six times a year, you know, plus the playoffs or whatever, and uh, we knew each other, and uh, right. so that was a that was a real challenge for me to to play against him, and so I think overall if I if I had to look at everything, including Patrick Ewing, David Robinson, all the way to Shaq, all the guys I played against. Um, Elijah want day in and day out was the toughest. And he would say wow. that about me too. We, we still, we still joke about it. I saw him a couple of years ago at an all-star game. And he's like, I was just telling my buddy, you were the toughest guy to play against. I hated playing against you. Uh, like, see that that's the no, ultimate no, sign of respect, <laughs> ultimate yeah. sign of respect right there. Love hearing that. But talking about those battles and I think about the physicality of the game and just, you know, just how the game was different before the rule changes, which is no space and pace now. But back then, 
I mean, I, I love being close to the game and I'd love guys gaining a competitive edge. Who is the best trash talker that you ever played against? Um, you know, I guess you have to go with Larry Bird, probably the best guy. <laughs> um, he would talk to you while he was scoring on you. Wow. And uh, I remember we were playing one game at the Saw Palace and, uh, and I think it was uh, Pace Mannion was on our team at that point in time. And um, he was guarding Larry and Robert Parrish went up to set a high pick on Larry uh, just off the edge of the top of the key. And, and so uh, Larry's starting to come over the top of the pick. Pace gets pinned and he yells, get him, Mark. And so I take a step out next to Robert Parrish to try and put my hand up and stop Larry Bird, right? And he's in full stride. He says, yeah, Mark, get this. And he just goes up off of one foot from like, what was that, 18, 19 feet? and just goes, throws one up. It doesn't even ripple the net as it goes through. He's like, yeah, you don't get that. I'm like. <laughs> <laughs> no, what can you do, right? <laughs> say that. You, you'd try and intentionally knock him down. He'd still find some way to score on the way down, you know, hitting his butt on the floor. He'd throw it up under your arm and up off of the glass. He's like, I'm, I'm, I surrender. I don't know how to stop this guy. Uh, great story. I, I can, I remember stories where, where coach Frank also talks about, you know, him, him just, you know, having a great game against the jazz. And he's like, you're really Frank, you're really going to put this guy on me. Have you got anybody else? And I guess Frank looked down the bench. And he's like, Nope. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. He would do that. He would turn around to head coaches and say, Hey coach, you got anybody on the bench that can guard me? And then turn around <laughs> and shoot a three pointer right in front of the coach, you know? Oh my gosh. Just le legendary. Well, here, here we've talked about players and competitiveness. Salt Lake has great fans. I think we've got a, an outstanding fan base and you think of, you know, your time traveling throughout the league. What's one of the craziest things that you ever observed or heard a fan say, because hecklers are one thing, but what's one of the craziest things you saw a fan do during a game? From in Salt Lake? Oh, in, uh, in, anywhere. anywhere. Well, um, probably the craziest thing is that, uh, and I tell this story once in a while, there was in, in Baltimore, I guess where it was at, Landover, Maryland, I guess it was back then. Uh, we played the Bullets, uh, we became the Wizards. Uh, and there was this guy who was an attorney who would stand behind the bench and scream at the top of his lungs the entire game. Now he wouldn't use profanity or anything, so he couldn't really throw him out. But he would just, you know, say our players are better than your players, and we got Jeff Mal or we got Jeff Malone, and we got Jeff Ruland, and we got Rick Mahorn, and we got this guy, and we got that guy, and we're gonna, you know, we're gonna kick your butt. And uh, so one one day in particular, um, we're there, and and you know, you go on one of these big East swings like the Jazz just been on here recently. Uh, and after a while, it's hard to win games, right? You're like, okay, you wake up in the morning, okay, what city are we in today, right? And uh, so we're, we're kind of in a little bit of a lull and um, we're playing the, the bullets at night and we're, you know, we're playing okay, but not great. And Bobby Hansen is out there, uh, Garden, Jeff Malone, I think it was. And Jerry Sloan, of course, being a two guard himself, he had particular interest in that position when he's watching the game, right? And so uh, we have a timeout and, and Jerry's kind of getting into it with Bobby and Bobby's kind of snapping back at Jerry. And this guy yells at us, Bobby Hansen, you don't have to listen to that. This is America. Call your agent. You know, this is the land of the free. This is Washington, D.C. We got the Washington Monument, the Lincoln Memorial. You don't have to take that crap. <laughs> so, oh, my goodness. Um, but he'd get so many. So he would get us so fired up that it actually gave us energy because we could, we were all of a sudden now like, you know, I, I don't care so much about the bullets anymore. I want to beat this guy. Right. And, uh, and it was the same with a lot of teams that would go through there. And I think he actually cost the, the bullets a lot of wins because we were just sleeping through half of the game. And then all of a sudden we we're on fire. We're like, Oh, we're look at the score, dude. <laughs> A, a la Spike Lee in New York. <laughs> Get right. the other team motivated. Yeah, similar thing, yep. Oh, I love it. You know, All-Star Weekend's coming up this weekend, Mark. And, you know, I, I think back, I think it was 89 when you made the All-Stars. And, and I look at that roster. I mean, you were with Clyde Drexler, James Worthy, Alex English, Carl Malone, Hakeem Olajuwon. It was coached by Pat Riley. What did you take away from that All-Star selection and that group of players in that locker room that year? You know, I, th I think the best part about making the all-star team for me was that uh, it was the coaches that had selected me, you know, that back then it was like the stuck it is now, I guess the, yeah, you know, the, uh, the starters are chosen by the fans and, yeah. and then the, the reserves are chosen by the coaches. And for me, it was like the ultimate sign of respect that, I mean, I didn't score that many points. I might've been averaging five or seven points a game or something at that point in time, but, 
but they recognized my impact on defense and they recognized my impact on the game of basketball. And so it was an ultimate compliment for me to be selected for that team. Now, that being said, once I got on the bus and I'm looking around and looking at all these guys on the bus, I'm like, what the hell am I doing on this bus? <laughs> uh, these guys. Um, so it was a, it was a great honor and I was just happy to be there for, for a little bit and, and, um, you know, and, and sitting next to James Worthy on the bench and talking about Coach Riley and some of the stuff that he did in terms of pre preparing. And I mean, he had plays for us and everything. I'm like, you got plays for an all-star game? Like, have you ever seen a team run a play at an all-star game? Because uh, it's just run and gun and shoot the, shoot the ball, right? But it was a great experience. We played in the Astrodome. There's like 39,000 people there. And uh, it was just really one of the highlights of my basketball career. Love it. Love it. Hey, I uh, had, a, had a, a question from one of the guys that watches our show quite frequently and he's a great writer here in salt lake uh jay Brandwright, and he, he wanted to know in 1988 when you guys beat portland and you went in against los angeles in that seven game series what do you remember most about that la laker seven game series uh, after you guys beat portland in an 88 uh, well, one was, is that, that the Lakers have been sitting there waiting for us and we got waxed after game one. And you remember Frank Layden closed the locker room to the press after that game, which incensed everybody. And he told us privately, he says, I'm going to close the locker room to the press. I'm going to go out there and tell them the Lakers are simply the greatest team that I've ever seen. We have no business being on the court with them. We're like, what are you talking about? Uh, and so, uh, he did that. And of course the LA times next day in the front page of the sports section is like jazz, jazz coach closes locker room to the press and they're just incensed and and then he said on tuesday night we're going to come back and kick their butts and um, <laughs> that's exactly what happened and uh it was a real turning point for the franchise uh we won some big games here we won on their floor we lost a big game six uh in salt lake that could have we could have you know put us to the next level uh and then and then we go to to um back down to LA and lose a real tight game seven. So that was, that was disappointing, but at the same time, it was a real stepping stone for our franchise of like, Hey, we're playing with the big dogs now. And from this, this uh, journey we've gone from being kind of the doormat of the NBA to, you know, being, being up at the upper, upper echelon now was a big step forward for the franchise yeah, and, for, and for our careers individually. That's right. And you, and you think about that series, it went seven games and of course they barely squeaked past the Utah Jazz, and they, they were the first team to repeat in 19 years. So, I mean, for you to, you know, challenge them that much and, you know, again, pivotal point for the Utah Jazz franchise, just just a wonderful series. Wow. Yeah, it was. And I, and I think that year, the Lakers, they went the max number of games in every round. Yeah. If I recall correctly. Yeah, yeah I, I think that's right. Um, you know, again, big men and the impact on the game right now. I mean, we've got about four minutes left here. But I look at Joel Embiid right now. I'm looking at Nikolai Jokic, uh, two big men that are having phenomenal years. I, and I look at what Rudy is doing for the Utah Jazz this year, seeing these guys as all-stars. But, you know, Jokic and Joel Embiid, you know, being front runners for the MVP. What does that mean to you looking at these young guys with the style of game that it is? And are, are you proud of that? And are, do, you, do you think there's ever going to be a pendulum swift where the big man will come back and, and, and be a center point for the game? You know, I think there's still a place for big men like me. And I was actually on another radio show earlier today talking with Will Purdue about that, uh, that, you know, you need that defense in the paint, especially when you get to playoffs. Yep. So, however, those two guys, uh, Jokic in particular, his ability to score anywhere and everywhere is just mind boggling. Like I text Rudy back and forth a little bit. We talk about that sometimes, but like, how do you stop that guy? I'm like, I have no idea. Like you don't, you have to kind of run some kind of switching defense where the, you know, a, a, a small forwards got him out on the paint and you switch him to a big guy if he comes, comes down or something. I don't know, but uh, I think the game has evolved so much and those guys uh, it's a credit to their coaches that they had growing up. Uh, that helped them develop these skills where not only are they a big guy, but they shoot three pointers, they can put the ball on the floor, they can bring the ball up the court, and there's like nothing they can't do. And, and a lot of that kind of thing comes from that more European style basketball that was that these guys grew up with and their club teams over there. Um, but it's uh, it's phenomenal to watch, and I, I love watching Jokic. I love watching oh, the, you know he, he plays at his pace, and, and he impacts the game at both ends of the floor, which I yeah. think is phenomenal. Let me see how I can score on you today. It was like Kevin Durant when he first started. You know, like, well, there so you I'll, go. I'll score on you at low post. I'll break you down some three point line. I'll do you know, I'll just take a three pointer this time. And 
It's, just, it's, it's mind boggling. It is. Well, Continue in on. wrapping up the show, we've got a couple minutes here. Take us back to March 1st, 1996. Your jersey, number 53, is being up to the rafters. Take us through your feelings and the emotions and what was that like to Mark Eaton to see your number 53 being raised to the rafters of, of Vivid Arena? Well, it was just the, the ultimate pinnacle of, a, of an athletic career, right? I mean, it doesn't get much better than that when they retire your jersey and name a day after you in the state. And um, uh, it was an incredible moment to be honored by the fans, by the team, by the community and, and the state at that uh, for what I did on the court. And you know, I didn't do anything other than what Wilt Chamberlain told me to do. My coaches told me to do over my career, but I stayed for a long time. And, and our team went from, you know, the doormat to the, the upper reaches of the NBA. And I think everybody recognized that. And, you know, and I always try to do what I could to help out around the community and stuff. And, and here I am 37 years later from, you know, the time I started in the NBA, I'm still living here and, and love it here. And it's just a great place. And, um, you know, I've been able to do a lot of other things business-wise since then as in, that in, in line with that feeling of really feeling like I, I'm just a, a part of the state. And so it was just a, the, you know, the ultimate, the ultimate prize for me, I think. Well, you know, Mark, it's so well-deserved because, you know, you think of, you know, your community involvement and, you know, how you reach out and you're helping others and just like your selflessness today to come on this show to share stories is just phenomenal and, and I'm so grateful. So again, let's use that hashtag ME seven foot four. And again, author of the four commitments. Uh, go out and get this book, support my friend, Mark. Mark, it's been a pleasure having you on the show here today. Um, we got to have you back. And uh, you know, here, here we are, we're, we're basically neighbors. I'm out here in Riverton and you're up there in near beautiful Park City. We got to get out there and let, let's go do some fly fishing sometime soon, my friend. Sounds good, coach. All right, All right appreciate buddy. It. Appreciate you coming on today. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been a fabulous show. I thank you for your time. Uh, stay tuned for our, our next show that's going to be streaming on Roku and Amazon Fire. But it's been a pleasure to be with Mr. Mark Eaton today as, he, as again, he's sharing the four commitments. Uh, hey, he's, he's a restaurant owner here in the valleys. And boy, I'll tell you what, some, some, great, some great food right there. So uh, go out and support him here if you're in the Salt Lake Valley. Look forward to seeing you soon, Mark. Everybody stay blessed, stay healthy, and enjoy All-Star Weekend. We'll see you soon with another edition of the Coach Scott Fields Show. Be blessed.